The Giants just wrapped up OTA practice number three. SNY's NFL reporter Connor Hughes is on to talk about his biggest takeaways from the day. Uh, Connor, I got FOMO watching your tweets today, man. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the studio today. You're out there at practice, so thanks for hopping on with us. Obviously, uh, anytime Daniel Jones speaks to the media, we know that's going to be a big thing. So what was that conversation like? Because I know the beat had questions. I think honestly, Brent, I think it was a little little tense at times. I mean, you know, Daniel's obviously somebody who's been very well media trained. Uh, he learned under the likes of Eli Manning, so he's kind of mastered uh, the art of saying a lot by also saying very, very little. So there's not usually too many headlines or anything like that to take away from it. But uh, listening to him or asking him questions about the Giants' obvious pursuit of a quarterback uh, in this year's draft specifically, Joe Shane trying so aggressively. Uh, to trade up there with the Patriots to get Drake May. You could tell that that annoyed Daniel Jones a little bit. I think his, his exact words were, you know, I wasn't too thrilled about it or I wasn't too fired up about it, I should say, is what he said. And, and maybe that is a good thing for the Giants because we think about to, back to the last time uh, that Jones played with a played a little ticked off and, and played with a chip on his shoulder. It was the year that he took the Giants to the playoffs and upset the Vikings in the first round. So uh, I think we've got a little bit of that here brewing with Daniel Jones, where he feels maybe like the Giants don't necessarily believe in him a ton, and now he's ready to go out there and prove to this organization and the fan base uh, that he's the player that was very deserving of that mega money contract extension he signed last year. Sometimes a little doubt can be the best motivation in this league. He got a chance to get out there on the field again for seven on sevens. How did he look in your eyes? Good. Yeah. Again, he, he's not doing uh, full team work yet, so it was just individual drills, routes on air, and then seven on seven, like you said. Uh, Jones did, though, say that he anticipates being a, a full go uh, for when training camp begins towards the end of July. So that would mean obviously doing everything out there with no limitations at all. In seven on seven drills, though, he looked good. You know, he was poised, uh, calm. He 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 delivered the ball with nice zip. He was accurate, decisive. More than anything else, though, Brandon, is he's working his way back from that torn ACL. I thought he moved well within the pocket. The Giants booted him out a couple of times, and there was no signs of any player that's working his way back from such a serious knee injury. He looked good. Yeah, it's crazy how guys come back from ACL injuries like that. And I know he's a quarterback, but that's good to have that mobility, especially when you can get confidence in that knee. Uh, another guy who's kind of got is, is highly motivated Kayvon Thibodeau I saw that he spoke to you guys yeah. as well uh he's always a character what was that conversation like and do you think he's prime for his biggest season yet well he opened his press conference before taking any questions by acknowledging and admitting that yes the goal this year is to break Michael Strahan's single season sack record of 22 and a half so uh that certainly set the stage and and this is a guy in Kayvon Thibodeau who's always he's always been good uh, in front of the cameras. He, he's always made some some headlines when he speaks. He's a very, very confident player. But as you said, this is about him now taking his game to the next level. And the Jazz are going to be relying on him more now this year than I think maybe they had his first two years. And a big reason for that is this new defensive scheme that is predicated on getting pressure with just the front four, which when it works, that's awesome because you're going to be able to drop guys back and help in coverage. But it's also predicated, again, on getting pressure from those front fours. So that means Dexter Lawrence. That means Brian Burns. That means Kayvon Thibodeau doing and creating pressure when it's not necessarily manufactured because that's what we saw at times from Wink Martindale. He would have guys stunt. He would run exotic blitzes where he freed players up by game plan design. That's not necessarily going to be the case too much here. What you're going to see is basically four guys on the front, and it is their job to beat the men in front of them and get to the quarterback. And, and Kayvon seems like he's up for the task, and certainly the notoriety that would come uh, with him creating such pressure in those kind of situations. Well, now that Brian Burns is here and we've got that duel out there, you guys got your first look at K5 and Brian Burns. How'd they look today? Uh, Burns is unbelievable. Now, now, Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal, they didn't practice. So Josh Zudu is, is who uh, Burns was going up against the majority of the time at left tackle, and, and we know kind of how that's going to go from last year. But uh, <laughs> Burns was very, very disruptive. Now, if he's doing this against Andrew Thomas, I think it probably means a little bit more. These are padless practices. But I had him for three sacks, which was pretty notable. In fact, at one point, he came around the edge so quick that he tapped Drew Locke uh, on the backside as he was running through and then threw his hand up to celebrate. Now, we talked to Burns after practice, and he said he doesn't count practice sacks until he can go back and watch the film, but he laughed and said a couple of those touchdowns that the offense scored, yeah, they're coming back because he got to the quarterback before Drew Locke let it go. Who else stood out on the field today? 
Uh, a big one that's going to make Giant fans very, very happy, it was Malik Neighbors. He made uh, the highlight of practice when he got behind Flott and Pinnock for a long touchdown from Drew Locke. We got just a little glimpse, Brandon, of what this guy can do. He is elusive. He is explosive. Uh, all of those traits that the Giants fell in love with during the pre-draft process, they were all evident on that play. We've seen little flashes of it, but now see it in a team setting of him truly using that speed off the line to get behind the defense, separating. Again, there, there wasn't a defender within two yards of him to then make that grab and trot into the end zone for a touchdown. It was exciting to see just about what he can potentially do, even in just his first season here with the Giants. Yeah, his yak capability is one thing but the way that he can yeah. go up for a ball and be just be spectacular with the catch and be such an athlete again everyone always tries to compare him to o obj but that is a great comparison from an athletic standpoint yeah. all right connor anything else from ota number three that we should know uh, that's pretty much it. I guess the, the other big note is it does look like Brian Dable is the one who's calling the plays, which he alluded to uh, at the NFL owners meetings. You know, you've, you've attended enough of these press conferences, man. You know Brian Dable says nothing. So when he sat at that, that coach's breakfast and, and had statistics to back how many offensive-minded offensive, uh, offensive head coaches are calling plays, how successful they have been, it kind of set the stage that he, not Mike Kafka, was going to be the one calling the plays. And through rookie minicamp, we saw a little glimpse of it. And now here in this OTA, it certainly seems like Brian Dable is going to be the Giants play caller this year. Very interesting, and that's something that we are definitely going to keep our eye on. Connor Hughes, thanks for taking your time and uh, joining us, man.